Hello everybody, welcome back to another Engineering Statics lecture video. Before we begin, as always, I just want to say I hope you guys are doing well and are ready for some more fun. And don't worry, this lecture video is fun, unlike the last one. Now, in the last video, we talked about moments in 3D, and if we wanted moments in 3D, we needed to use cross product, and they were very related to each other. Now, by themselves, they're, they're quite big topics, but I threw them into one video, which was like 30 minutes long, or I think 35 minutes long, and you guys may have been dying by the end of it, because let's be honest, no one wants to listen to a lecture video for that long, but I said that these two topics are so intertwined that it's best to cover them together. So if you guys think about moments in 3D, you guys think about cross product. Or if you think about cross product, you think about moments in 3D. Now, in your later courses, you'll learn that the cross product has a wide variety of other features, but that'll be a surprise for another time. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning what we did last lecture is because if we want moments in 3D, we have to use cross product. And that's fine. Cross product, it's not too bad. I can do it once or twice and not get fatigued. But if I have to do it a lot, well, it's going to start becoming a real pain in the ass. And that's why today we're going to talk about something called moment couples. Now, moment couples aren't going to be anything too crazy. They're not going to be something extremely new. But it's a technique that will allow you guys to solve for moments very fast. All right. And that, again, that's the name of the game when we get to exams. If you guys weren't speedrunners before, trust me, after your first university exam, you'll become speedrunners of exams. So let's figure out what exactly these moment couples are and how they will help us in, a, in exam type scenarios. So we're going to start off with the basic case. Again, if I want to show you guys something, the best way to show you is going to be in 2D and then we will extend it to 3D afterwards. So a moment couple system is a set of two parallel forces. So if I was in the vertical direction, I'd have one force here, I'd have another force here, so the vertical, and they have equal magnitude and opposite sense. So again, if I was in the vertical direction, one would be going upwards of, let's say, 10, and the other one would be going downwards of 10. So they're parallel, opposite direction, and have the same magnitude. The final requirement is that they are actually separated by some non-zero distance. So they actually have to be spaced apart. If I have the two forces that are uh, parallel, equal magnitude and opposite, but they're right on top of each other, then it's not a couple. They have to actually be separated by some non-zero distance. What these actually do is create something called a couple. The best way to show you guys this is to show you guys a beam. So let's say I had a beam here and I had two forces on the beam. So again, I have one force going downwards and one force going upwards. So they're opposite and parallel and they have the same magnitude, which I'm going to call F. Now, again, the final requirement is that these two forces are separated by some distance D. Now, with these two forces, we can do a variety of things. The first thing is let's take equilibrium. So if I were to go with summation of forces in the X direction, while you guys are laughing at me saying, Clayton, you're an idiot, they're vertical, there's going to be no X component, I agree, so they create no uh, horizontal translation. The next thing is, if I take the summation of forces in the vertical direction, I have a force going downwards of F, and I have a force going upwards of F. So in the end, I have F minus F. So notice here that the summation of forces in the vertical direction, even though there is forces in that direction, is going to be zero. This effectively means that these two forces on our body are not going to make it translate and they're not going to make it go up or down vertically. Where the trick comes into play is when we take the sum of the moments. So let's say that we want to take the summation of moments around this point over here, point number one. Well, we know that the summation of moments around one is going to be the force F multiplied by the perpendicular distance X times D. And if you guys are wondering, hey, Clayton, why is that positive? Well, this would be the force kind of on the right. So if I have point one over on the left-hand side and I have my force going upwards, we can see that it starts to create that counterclockwise rotation. Therefore, it's going to be positive. And if we look at the force on the left side, it's simply going to be F times X. And if we were to take the moment about one, so it's going downwards, we can see that it starts to create that clockwise rotation. Therefore, it's negative. Now, if you guys take a step back and say, hey, wait a second, something looks a little fishy here. Well, there is. We have F times X on both sides, so we can actually cancel it out. And we actually get that the summation of moments is going to be the force times the distance between them. So this is going to be kind of the key thing with moments. We have a force times the distance between them. 
If I were to take the moments about a separate point, so in this case I now have point 2, and this point is on the line of action of one of the forces, well, this creates a much simpler equation, where the summation of moments around 2 is simply just going to be the force times the distance between the two forces. So notice how these two are actually the same. So from this, we can actually create some conclusions about moments, or sorry, moment couples in two dimensions. The first is the summation of forces in both the horizontal and the vertical direction are actually equal to zero. So these two forces cause no translation. So it's not going to go side to side. It's not going to go up or down. It's just going to stay the same. However, these two forces create a moment about any point, which produces a non-zero rotation. So even though these forces are not moving our object side to side or up and down, it is rotating our object. So there's kind of the key here. Now, this is actually very nice because this allows us to create a nice formula for what we call moments in two dimensions, where the moment couple is equal to our force, so one of the forces times the perpendicular distance between them. What's nice about this is this actually applies to every point in our system. So notice how these two forces above, they created the same moment whether I'm taking it about point one or I'm taking it about point two. They create the same moment at any point in the system. And what's nicer for us is that it's only one calculation. Notice if I want to take the moment about point one, it's completely valid, but I actually had two components, I had to simplify it, and then I get my final answer. If I were to realize that this is a moment couple, I can easily take the moment as simply the force times the distance between them. And again, that's the name of the game when it comes to engineering in university, is you want to save time. This will help you save time because it's one calculation rather than two. Now you guys are saying, Clayton, look at that. Summation of the moments are on one. It's easy. Sure, it's going to take me an extra, extra time, but it's going to be what, an extra 10 seconds? Well, yeah, it's not too bad in this case. But typically in exams, they don't give you just one moment couple. They'll give you something like this. Now students looking at, at this will say, okay, well, if I want to take the summation of moments, it's actually not too bad. But as we're going to see, it's going to get a little bit lengthy. So let's say that we had a beam and we had a bunch of external loads applied on our beam. Now the first thing that we're going to do, and we're going to talk more about this in next week's topics, is we're actually going to solve for these support conditions. All right, we're going to solve for AX, AY, and BY. Again, that's going to be the topic of next week, so don't worry too much about it right now. All I want to show you guys right now is let's say that we wanted to take the summation of moments about point A. So that's that pin on the left-hand side. Well, we know if we're doing moments, we need distances. So let's define our beam as length L and the distances between all those forces as D1, D2, D3, D4, etc. Now, if we were to ignore the idea of couples, well, we can still find the moment about A. It's just going to start becoming a real shit show. And again, that's the thing you want to avoid in exams. You want to keep it nice, simple, and clean. So if we look here, we basically have two big components and then the support reaction. We have F1 times D1 and then minus F1 times D1 plus D2. So those are those two forces taken separately. Moving on to the next two forces, it starts to get even more messy where we have F2 times sine theta. So I just found the vertical components, multiplied it by its distance. And then I moved on to the F2 kind of on the rightmost side. And at the very end, I have BY times L. So if we look at this, it's doable. You guys know what you're doing. But it, it gets kind of messy. Again, the name of the game in exams is trying to find the most simplistic way to actually solve this system. So let's say option two, and this time let's consider couples. If we look at F1 and F2, they are equal magnitude. It's simply F1. They're parallel. They're opposite sense. Everything is good to go. And the same thing for F2. F2 is a little bit more crazy because it's at an angle. But as we can see, they are actually still parallel with each other, opposite direction, and equal magnitude. So if I were to take the summation moments about A for this case, I know that F1 is actually a moment couple. So all I need to do is I need to take the force F1, multiply it by the distance between them. So in this case, we have it as D2. That's the distance between them. Now notice one thing is that when it comes to moment couples, we still have to consider the sign. So if we look at F1 and uh, F1, <laughs> I was gonna say F1 and F1, but that doesn't really make sense. If we were to apply the two forces, we can see that we are starting to create that clockwise rotation. Therefore, it's going to be negative. Now, we can move on 
to f2 here, and we can say, all right, I have f2 times sine theta times d4. Now you guys may be saying, Clayton, how exactly did you get that? Well, splitting vectors into components is still the way to go even when we deal with moment couples. So if we look at these two forces, we know that we can separate them into their components. Now notice that the two vertical components now are still equal and opposite, and the horizontal components are the exact same. But notice how the horizontal components actually intersect each other, right? They have a zero, uh, zero distance between them. Therefore, the horizontal components they won't create any sort of moment couple. It's only going to be those vertical components. So I took the vertical component, which is F2 times sine theta, and then I just multiplied it by the distance between it, which is D4. Now again, I had to consider the rotation. So on this side, we have a force going down. This side, we have a force going up. As we can see, we start to create that clockwise rotation. Therefore, it's going to be negative. Now again, the reason why we're doing this, it's easier. If you guys want to do option one, it's valid. You guys will get the correct answer, but it's just going to take you guys longer. Name of the game in exams, moment couples. I know at uh, the University of Alberta, at least, and uh, this is one exam secret, if you will, but the first uh, moment question that you guys usually get, it has like eight forces on it, eight forces. And then it just overwhelms students. Students don't know what to do. They're gonna get a little bit scared. But out of those eight forces, four were couples. So they could easily solve for the moments at each one of the forces. But students, again, they see all those forces, they get overwhelmed, and then they don't start uh, thinking straight, if you will. That's one other trick for exams. Don't get overwhelmed. Just take a deep breath, relax, it'll all be fine, and then continue on. When you're overwhelmed, you can't really think straight. Now, moment couples in 2D, they're pretty simple, pretty easy to see. What happens when we extend it to 3D? Remember, 3D, if we wanted a moment in 3D, we used cross product. Again, I'm gonna try and relate them all the time. Moment in 3D, cross product. Well, it turns out a moment couple in 3D is going to use the exact same thing, where a moment couple in 3D is going to be a position vector between the two vectors crossed with one of the force vectors. But the only thing we have to keep in mind is that order here is going to be important. So we're gonna talk about that in just a second. So let's say I have my three-dimensional vector space, I have my two forces, and we're saying, all right, they look like they're opposite, they look like they're equal magnitude, et cetera, et cetera. I can create a moment couple here by simply just creating a position vector between these two force vectors and crossing them together. Again, the only real trick here is that order is going to matter. So if I'm using FB as my force vector in the cross product, I have to make sure that my position vector goes from A to B. It has to end up at the vector that you want to cross. So if I wanted to use FA, then I would use position vector B to A. All right, so that's gonna be the only thing. If you guys mix that up, what's going to happen is you guys are going to get the same components, but it's going to be opposite in sign. So it's one of those things that it's not gonna change your answer too much, but you guys will get marks taking off Unfortunately, again, you guys want to have all those part marks as you can. That's the name of the game when it comes to exams. Now you guys may be saying, all right, Clayton, not too bad. I just take a cross product. But how exactly can I tell if FA and FB are opposites and equal? Well, the way we do that is actually look at the components. So in this particular case, if FA is equal to FXI minus FYJ minus FCK, then FB must look something like this. Now, the key here is that all the components are opposite signs. And again, the key, all of the components are opposite signs. So if we look at FX, or I guess the I component, on FA we have FX, on FB we have negative FX. If we move on to the J component, at A we have negative FY, and on B we have positive FY. And then the same thing for the K direction. And I'm gonna say this one more time, all the components have to be opposite sign. One professor was real sly one year where he made the two I components opposite sign, he made the two J components opposite sign, but he had the two K components as the same sign, but all the same, uh, the magnitudes were the same. So students looked at that and they thought, ah, it's close enough, it must be a couple, but it's not. So there's kind of a key here. All of those components have to be opposite sign. If they're not opposite sign, even one of them, then it's not a couple and we have to use our old methods of cross product to figure out the moments about a point. 
Now, why is this so important to us in 3D? Well, it's actually better than 2D because this saves us a lot more time. Let's say that in general, I was given these two force vectors and I wanted the moment about point O. Well, what I would have to do is I'd have to create a position vector from O to FA, cross it together, get my first moment, and then I'd have to create a second position vector from O to B, cross that with my force vector B, get a second moment, and then add them together. In this particular case, all I need is one position vector, which goes from force A to force B, and then cross it with force B, I'm good to go. So the major thing to keep in mind is that the moment a moment couple creates, it's valid around any point. So if I were to go RAB cross with RB, get that moment couple, that's the moment about point O, that's the moment about point whatever in your system. So that's kind of one of the, the nice things. It's valid at any point in the system. All right, so that's going to be it for moment couples. Um, hopefully this video isn't too long. <laughs> I, I kind of went over time again. I'm sorry. Uh, I know that you guys have a lot on your plate, so I apologize for making the videos longer, but I just really want to prepare you guys for exams, give you guys all the tips and tricks that I know. Now, if you guys are saying, Clayton, this is a little bit confusing, don't worry. There's going to be examples in the description below to kind of help show you guys what moment couples are. Again, something that you don't really need to 100% know for exams because everything we learned previously is valid for the exams, but this is a great way to save time in exams, which is what you guys are going to want to do. And moment couples, as you guys are going to see, are going to set us up nicely for the next topic in the next video, which is force reduction, which is going to be a key part of any midterm. I know that uh, it is here at the University of Alberta, and I'm sure it is in other places around the world. So, yep, that's it for this video. I want to thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate it. If I wasted you guys' time, I'm really sorry. I hope you guys have a wonderful day today, and I will see you guys in the next lecture video.